Welcome to the University of California, San Francisco Sports Medicine Podcast featuring Dr. Nira Fundia, Dr. Brian Feely, and Dr. Drew Lansdowne discussing hot topics in sports medicine and society. We hope you enjoy our podcast and look forward to hearing from you. All right, welcome everyone to our UCSF Sports Medicine Podcast, six to eight weeks with myself, Dr. Nira Fundia, Dr. Brian Feely, uh, Dr. Drew Lansdowne usually is joining us. We are not quite sure what he is doing today. Um, but we will be talking about one of the things he actually does take a lot of uh, care of, uh, which we do as well, too, is cartilage. Now, a lot of individuals come into clinic are worried about their cartilage. They wonder, can we grow cartilage? Can we treat it? Can we repair it? Um, but don't exactly know what cartilage is. There's a lot of different things that go from a basic science level, and there's tons of new things that's going on in terms of cartilage, both good and bad, in terms of how we can help treat it and help make sure that people are healthy and active. So, Maybe the first question for you, Brian, because I think we just assume that everyone knows what cartilage is, and even our residents sometimes, you know, can't define what it is. What, what exactly is cartilage, and what, what types are there? Yeah, I think uh, I don't know how many different types there are, so we'll talk about the ones that actually <laughs> matter. Um, so the best way to think about cartilage is it's this smooth surface on the end of your bone that keeps you from feeling your joints moving back and forth, and it's an extremely specialized structure. And I think there's a couple different properties that are important to keep in mind. One um, is the, the surface friction is essentially zero. So cartilage is so smooth, it's smoother than taking a piece of ice and sliding it across another piece of ice. Um, and the second is cartilage has no nerve endings. So we don't feel our joints when we move back and forth. And that's part of the problem with arthritis or with larger cartilage injuries is that once you've lost that cartilage and you're starting to put the load onto bone, bone has a lot of nerve endings. So bone will actually feel that load and it will report back to you by saying, I've got pain. It'll report back to the joint by causing swelling. Um, but different people tolerate that differently. But the important part about the cartilage is as long as you've got that smooth cap on the end of the bone, you have no arthritis and you're going to have no pain when you're moving um, your joints back and forth. Yeah, I know. I think that's, you know, it's important for that to understand. I think a lot of people also, you know, kind of the, the concept of almost like a diagram of like, you've got your bone and almost like the shiny end of it is the cartilage as, as well too. And there, there's multiple kinds of cartilage. You know, there's cartilage on the ends of bones. The meniscus is actually considered a type of cartilage as well too. So, oh yeah, that one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm here to, here, to, here to educate you as well too, Brian. Um, awesome. The, um, but I think, you know, people here, and we see this with professional athletes reports, so like so-and-so injured their cartilage. Well, that can mean so many different things. You know, is it the meniscus? Is it part of your cartilage where you actually put pressure on? Is it a part of the cartilage where you don't put pressure on it? Um, you know, they had cartilage surgery. What does that mean? So I think there's you know, cartilage is such a broad topic and where it's located and what joint it, it's in is, is very, very important. You know, the cartilage in the shoulder is, you know, not as important, you know, shoulder replacements, whatever that's all about and shoulder replacements, cartilage. Yeah, I think there's very, there's a very wide injury spectrum when we talk about cartilage injuries. So starting with kids, what are the options when you have a young kid with a cartilage injury? Can you ever just observe it or protect them? And when do you think about operating on kids with cartilage injuries? And um, I think for the sake of uh, time and discussion, let's focus on knee injuries because those represent about 80% of cartilage injuries in kids. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I think the trend, you know, for a while for kids has been, well, they're kids, they heal things better. I mean, their bones heal quicker. And there was a thought that cartilage would heal as well too. But I think one of the, the ways we're thinking about this a little differently is that, you know, it's your opportunity, particularly when you look at kids who have cartilage injuries over 10 to 15 years, particularly in the knee, is that we know it's going to degenerate over time. And they're not necessarily going to heal these injuries just kind of by observing them. Um, and also they're going to be stressing their knees more. I mean, they're going to be playing sports and we're doing high impact activities. So definitely the trend is to change to being more aggressive in kids. And I think one of the things that we see a lot of in kids is they'll be born with something called an OCD, which is an osteochondral defect, which means that the bone and cartilage is impacted. And one of the options we have is to try to get these to heal. So one of the ways you can try to get things to heal if you catch it early is you just keep kids off of it. You know, that is a form of treatment where you'll say, look, you're very young. You've got a lot of growth remaining. Let's just offload the area and it'll heal almost like a broken bone. Sometimes that doesn't work. And sometimes you have to actually fix these pieces of bone and cartilage in place. When things get bad, that's when you start getting into the bigger, bigger surgeries where if the bone and cartilage doesn't heal or it falls off, then you're starting to do more adult type surgeries where you're transplanting cartilage or pieces of bone as well too. So I think 
in general, we try to be a little bit more aggressive in terms of fixing these injuries or treating them, and that may mean keeping them off of it. Um, but then we are seeing more and more kids who are getting adult type injuries because they're wearing their cartilage away, and we're learning that these surgeries are safe. So I think a lot of those options are definitely available for kids. How about you, Brian? What about in adults? Like, is your are you more aggressive, less aggressive? Because then you start seeing arthritis kind of come into the picture as well, too. Yeah, I think, and we can talk about what the non-operative options are as well. But I think from a surgical standpoint, we really don't know. And I think the hardest thing that we struggle with when patients come into clinic is that their symptoms and their MRI is a snapshot in time. And it's hard to figure out, is this a blip in a long degenerative process? Or are we seeing them on the downslope where there was a little blip where they feel a little bit worse and anything we do isn't gonna make a difference? Or is this an isolated cartilage injury and it's time to intervene because that's gonna change the natural history of their injury process? So I think there are some things that we can use to point in different directions. Um, I think for me, what I look for is a, are you truly absolutely um, pain-free, swelling-free before you came in? If yes, and you there was an acute event, I fell snowboarding, I landed directly on my knee, I treat that patient differently than, you know, I've had these achy knees for a while and now this is worse. No matter what that MRI shows, especially in the last five years, I take that story a lot more seriously because I think that is your knee's way of saying, I haven't been totally healthy and I've been doing some things you don't want me to do. Like I'm, you know, I'm staying up late at night, I'm smoking a little and I'm letting my cartilage degenerate a little bit. So I think for those patients, I don't think surgical management is the ideal option, except for in very few cases. In the first case where it's an acute injury, mm -hmm. I agree with you, just like a kid, it's, it's that time to intervene and it's time to be as aggressive as possible because the 10 to 15 year data of, of some of the cartilage surgeries are they do better with surgery and they do better with intervention than the natural history. Yeah. You know, one thing we hear a lot about, and, and you know, particularly this is in professional athletes years ago, is this it's the surgery called microfracture. You know, and it sounded like it was kind of like a grab bag, you know, cartilage injury, you're gonna get microfracture done. How were the outcomes of that in adults or in kids? I can, you know, obviously it's it's been poor in general just because they wear it away. But how about in adults? Is that ever an option for for regrowing cartilage? Yeah, I think the data around microfracture is really interesting. So for people that don't know, the idea is that you po you have a full thickness cartilage defect or a near full thickness cartilage defect, meaning you have no cartilage all the way down to the bone on especially the end of your femur, at the end of the part of your um, um, bone in your knee that comes down from your thigh bone. When we poke holes in the bone, the idea is that some of the cells will come through, look around, and form a cartilage-like structure. And this, this goes on with um, some physical therapy that's very specific. You have to be non-weight bearing for about a month and a half. You have to go in a motion device for six hours and a night. And the data shows that when we look at the cartilage, either with an MRI or with histology, it's okay cartilage. It forms like a cartilage-like scar tissue gives you some protection that tends to not work as well over the age of 40 and certainly not nearly as well over the age of 50. And it seems to be an okay option. Now, the problem is, is there hasn't really been the study of microfracture versus what if we just go in and clean things up? So there hasn't really been a good mm -hmm. rigorous study as is this really the least invasive thing that we can do for cartilage? Um, this becomes problematic because a lot of our control studies, um, when we look at um, bringing new technologies into the clinic and give patients the option for um, the next generation of cartilage surgeries, it's controlled to microfracture, which oftentimes patients have heard, well, it doesn't work that well. So I don't want to be a part of this study because I don't want that blinded arm to be microfracture. Um, my general sense is I will do microfractures for very small injuries, less than a centimeter by a centimeter in conjunction with something else. So if I'm doing an ACL and they have a very small cartilage injury, it's not going to change their rehab process. Um, otherwise, I have very limited indications for it. I think the five to seven year data suggests it doesn't work after that. And if I tell a patient, hey, I've got this surgery that makes you feel different and it's going to work for five years, they're going to be back in there doing a bigger procedure a pretty normal patient will say, well, why not just do the bigger procedure now and get it done with? Yeah. And I think another thing that's important to also think about, and we get a lot of 
patients coming who may have a cartilage mm -hmm. defect is be like, well, where is that cartilage defect potentially uh, coming from? Um, you know, is it because how your bones are aligned? You know, like, do you have, you know, is your, do you have a knock knee? Is that why your cartilage is getting worn away? Or in the case of particularly with kneecaps, like, do you have a ligament injury or is your, is your joint unstable? And that's why your cartilage is getting degenerated. So I think part of treating these injuries, if we go down surgery as well, too, you just want to go in there and put some fancy cartilage or, you know, do some sort of procedure and not understand why that cartilage got wore away in the first place, especially if there isn't like a one-time injury that did it. So that may be in conjunction with doing some sort of ligament surgery or, or cutting the bone. So I think um, it's about putting all the, all the pieces together. Um, but in the absence of like these kind of surgical things, what are ways, particularly in adults, can keep their cartilage healthy? That's a question that we, you know, I'm sure you get a lot of like, how can I keep my cartilage healthy so I don't develop arthritis in one of my 40s and 50s? Yeah, well, I'm going to go back and just talk a little bit about that alignment. So I think when we talk about patients that do need cartilage surgery, and regardless of the cartilage surgery that we do, oftentimes what goes on behind the scenes before we even see the patient is we've looked at their x-rays, we've looked at other risk factors that would say, are they a good candidate or not? And that's really going to get, guide that informed decision making. And in general, when I think about who's a good cartilage patient, a little bit younger, meaning under the age of 50. Um, their leg is well aligned or they're willing to have it realigned at the time of surgery. So we usually check that with either a standard or a like a longer x-ray of their leg. Um, they have to have their meniscus and ligaments and they can't have any rheumatologic conditions that are going to accelerate that breakdown potentially. All that is done before we even see the patient. So oftentimes it seems like a pretty straightforward conversation with the patient, but that's because we've spent a half hour doing all the measurements before we even go into the room. And then when we talk about like what type of cartilage procedure we're gonna do, really depends on kind of the nature of that injury. Is it just, you know, it's location. So it's like real estate, location really matters. Can, do we need to go all the way down into the foundation? and replace everything. So are we gonna do something where we transplant cartilage and bone? Um, can we take your own cartilage and regrow that and put it back in? Or do we have to get cadaver tissue and put that back in? And all the hard part with that is it's a little bit of surgeon dependent on what they like and what their experience has been. And it's also patient dependent. It's a little bit even insurance dependent. So these are all expensive surgeries. Um, so not all insurance companies will cover all different options. And there are no great comparative studies to say treatment X versus treatment Y 10 years down the line. So a lot of it is going to be what your surgeon is comfortable with, where the lesion is. But for the most part, if you present one case to a group of surgeons, a vast majority of them will agree. And the other ones will disagree, but have pretty reasonable reasons why. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I think one other thing that we'll get patients to ask about is, can you inject this stuff? Can you inject cartilage cells in there? Because I think there's more and more a thought that surgery bad, you know, surgeons doing these big procedures. Um, I'm just going to get a quote unquote stem cell injection or cartilage cell injection. Um, obviously, we don't see this very much in the pediatric population, but what, what do you tell patients when they come in and ask you, like, can you inject something into my knee to regrow my cartilage? No. <laughs> and they leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then they write a two-star review for me. Um, no, I think it's it's tough because if you look at websites, they will, especially for these stem cell clinics, they say, well, why go through this in horribly invasive complex surgery like a knee replacement when you can just have an injection of cells? And we've covered this on a variety of other podcasts, but realistically, the problem is, is when we inject cells, they lice, they explode, they die, they do not engraft. And even in the best case scenarios, there's been a few studies that show in the United States, a stem cell therapy where you inject um, mesenchymal uh, stromal cells, which are stem cell-like um, cells that are from your own bone marrow you will have scar-like tissue there for about six to 12 months. And that's been shown on second look arthroscopy and um, MRI, which sounds an awful lot like how we talked about microfracture. You're creating this like scar-like tissue that's gonna wear away over time. Now, if you felt better and you could have this injection once a year and it was free and your insurance covered it, I don't think that's the worst thing in the world. But right now, insurance doesn't cover it because as long no long-term benefit. The outcomes don't really show that patients feel all that much better compared to a well-designed control. And it can be anywhere from ten to thirty thousand dollars. So will we get there? We may. We will probably get better treatments than we have now, but we're not, it's not right around the corner. Yeah. 
And then, you know, I think kind of obviously the, the final kind of the end game with a lot of these cartilage injuries is a knee replacement surgery. Um, what exactly is a knee replacement? I mean, people, you know, are you just putting a whole new robot knee in there? Like what's the, uh, wh what is a knee replacement surgery? Because I think some people don't quite understand what it is. They just think it's like something where you're just taking everything out and putting, putting some robot in. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm going to need that. Um, so I think it's a bad name for it. So I think a hip replacement is a good name for a hip replacement because you do lop off the ball. Um, the entire ball goes in the trash and you replace it with a new ball. And it turns out a ball and socket is really easy to recapitulate. I think a knee replacement should be called a knee resurfacing because essentially what we do at the time of surgery is you open up the knee and you get these specific guides and they're not necessarily patient specific, although some companies do have those, but they are very specific to the size of your femur and it's very interchangeable. So if you are a 140 pound, five foot eight person versus a 240 fat pound, five foot 10 person, you're going to get very different cuts for your knee. Um, and then that's going to help give a implant that's essentially a cap on either side of the bone um, that's going to make you feel better. Um, the reason why it makes you feel pretty much better, but not perfectly better, is you no longer have that bone rubbing against bone, but you haven't perfectly restored the kinematics. Um, so most patients feel like when they have a knee replacement, they feel a lot better. They're able to be more active, but they're not quite perfect. Now, if you ask for satisfaction, most patients will say like, you know what? I'm satisfied. More than 90% of patients are satisfied, but that satisfaction is weighted in that, like their expectations where they told their knee was going to be perfect. And like they were 20 again, versus where they told, hey, this isn't a perfect knee, but it's a lot better than what you have right now. And it's going to buy you another 15 years of happiness before we even have to think about it again. Yeah. And, you know, kind of a piggyback on that as well, too. One last question for you, Brian, is that a lot of times we'll hear about, you know, 60, 70 year olds getting a, uh, a scope, a camera put in their knee uh, to kind of like help clean up arthritis. Um, and then, you know, what, what do you feel about that? Can you, can you clean up, clean up that kind of thing? Yes, you can. It works no better than if we pretend to clean it up. Um, and I think the hard part is it seems like in a in a a something that you can go after. And for the most part, studies suggest that in the setting of arthritis without a meniscus tear, you're going to do absolutely fine um, just with normal treatment, anti-inflammatories, activity modification, push through it. Um, and you'll be okay. With a meniscus tear, there may be some patients that benefit from surgery, but it's going to be only about 30% of them. Okay. And then, you know, finally, sorry, one more last question. I <laughs> always have more stuff to ask you. Um, what can you do to keep your cartilage healthy? Like how, how, what is healthy cartilage? Like what are the, what are the factors that go into promoting healthy cartilage? Yeah, I think for better, for worse, having healthy cartilage is one genetic. So if you have a family history of of arthritis, you are more likely to have arthritis at a younger age. The second is avoiding injury. The biggest risk factor for decreasing that age where you get um, knee arthritis um, or arthritis in any part of the body is a severe injury. So if you have multiple ACL injuries, you are going to lower the age that you may develop arthritis. Um, but beyond those, I think it's a combination of a variety of little things that are for better, for worse, are pretty simple varying exercise, a combination of load, which helps strengthen your bone and also provide nutrition to your joints. The more you load, the more you're pushing fluid through your cartilage. Um, eating healthy um, provides the right nutrients, just like for the rest of your body. Supplements like chondroitin, glucosamine have been shown to be non-beneficial. So there is no benefit to taking fancy joint juice, joint supplements, things that look fancy because they're in that giant jar they will not make you feel any better. But if you are taking them in combination because you take that pill and that reminds you to go exercise and it reminds you to eat healthy at the end of the day, that is totally okay. They are not doing any harm. And then the, I think the last thing is keeping your weight at a reasonable expectation for your body size. So it doesn't mean you have to be um, rail thin, but obesity and morbid obesity adds weight and it adds inflammation to your body. And as much as it's hard to say that weight loss is the best way to improve your um, joint health. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just, you know, kind of like the thing we use with a car, like you take care of your car more, you, you know, keep the, keep the car nice and smooth and fast running your cartilage is going to last longer. So absolutely. Yeah, well, we can, we can have a Toyota. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And you know, my Prius, good cartilage. <laughs> 
Um, so thank you everyone once again for listening to our podcast. We can do hours and hours on cartilage and arthritis. Hopefully this covers some of the basics and uh, we hope you listen to our next episode. Thank you.